I don't see myself as being so much the person you're inducing him as being his warm-up act. <laughs> I brought a special guest to Rotary today, Alan Damashek. Alan and George have been friends for a long time. We've been friends for a long, long time. Some would say since the eighth day of creation. <laughs> this is a very special week for George. He's finally giving what amounts to as his uh, uh, classification talk to Rotary. And he turns 85 years old on Friday. George, George has asked uh, Bill Wolf to be here today. I think mainly because he likes to have somebody call him kid. <laughs> Bill turned 93 last week. George is a radio guy, really a radio pioneer. In his 30-year career, he was general manager of WORK, a play-by-play uh, -play sports announcer and a sports talk show host. They would have given him a drive time slot, but they were afraid his voice might scare the horses. <laughs> scare the horses. <laughs> you're, you're, you're safe for a minute. He joined the Rotary Club of York on January 3rd in 1968, 46 years ago. 45 of those years have been spent sitting at that table. <laughs> From 1977 to 1988, he was an administrative position at Memorial Hospital, during which time he served as president of the Rotary Club from 1983 to 1984. In 1987, he led a district exchange to the third world country of Bangladesh. Surviving that, he figured what else could he do, so he went into politics. In 1988, he was elected a York County Commissioner and served as president commissioner from 1992 to 1995. Another notable fact, George has been married to Chi Chi, obviously a child bride, for 60 years, which says a lot about Chi Chi's patience. <laughs> Over the years, George has been the voice of York's sports night, the Spring Garden Band, the July 4th celebration, and numerous pageants and shows, and of course, as a song leader here at Rotary. If you want to know more about George, and there's a lot more to know, copies of his book, A Life, will be available in the lobby after the show, uh, or after the meeting. <laughs> Fellow Rotarians and guests, please welcome the voice of York County, George Trout, to the podium with a rousing chorus of Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear George. Happy birthday to you. I enjoy the antics of the introducers more than you're going to enjoy me. <laughs> I, I must uh, say one thing before I move on. Um, I am so honored that Bill Wolf and Corny are here today. It means a great deal to me. Uh, Bill joined this club, I think, in 1948. He's not nodding, but I think I'm right. We have, we have two things in common. We're both veterans of this club, and we both had the good fortune to marry two of York County's beauties. And one is there and one is there. So thank you, Bill, for being here. I, I appreciate it. I know that it uh, took some uh, doing to get here. So thanks. You may have noticed a young lady walk up to me uh, a few minutes ago. I had no idea who she was, but she told me I did know who she was. And that's always a little dangerous platform to walk on. I said, how would I know you? And my wife is sitting behind me. <laughs> she said, you really wouldn't remember me, but let me tell you a little story about you and me, which is another dangerous stuff. <laughs> she said, when you were at the radio station, you were having lunch in the Yorktown Hotel with the two gentlemen who owned the station at the time, and I was a waitress there. 
I came up to wait on you, and you looked at me and said, what a beautiful voice you have. You should be in radio. And she said, well, that's interesting because I'm in the communications course at your college, and that's what I want to do someday. I said, well, come down to the station and let me talk to you after you finish work today. And she did. She came down. We talked. I hired her. She didn't tell me how long she stayed, but she was on WORK for some time, and you just never know when someone is going to walk up and shake your hand and thank you for their career, but she did, and I really appreciate it. Yes, this is my fourth um, classification talk. <laughs> my first was radio, then healthcare, then government, and now today. And I suspect there's nothing left for me to say, except uh, I'm going to say a few things to you. Uh, thank you, Gordon. It's always an honor to have you introduce me, and a good laugh, too. Uh, and uh, in so far as my book is concerned, the last portion of my book will be an editorial by Gordon Freirich. I regard him with such a high degree that I posted uh, one of his editorials about me from, 19, from 2010 as the last piece in my book. I don't think you knew that, so you better hope it was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I entered the club, as Gordon told you, and participated in numbers of committees became president in 1983-84. And as president, I sometimes made comments about my alter ego, Grand Pappy Trout. Excuse me. Yes. I can see I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Getting up this morning, I found now I am Grand Pappy Trout. <laughs> I sometimes made comments about Grand Pappy when I was president. Uh, that's a long time ago. There are 65 females in the club who weren't in it then, and that was no fault of mine, believe me, ladies. <laughs> um, there are about 85 men here who I think were not in the club in those days. And so about half of the club then is familiar with my life and portions of my career. As a personnel director at Memorial Hospital and terms of two terms of county commissioners, all I could tell was whether or not the club was active and busy, and I tried to keep them that way when I was president. The president today has given me this privilege since no other mass president in my investigation has ever been allowed to get up and push a book and actually sell a book from this podium. <laughs> Someone told me that uh, A.B. Farquhar, A.B. Farquhar, Farquhar Estates, Farquhar Park, wrote a book in 1922, and he did. The title of it was The First Million of the Hardest. He meant dollars, of course. There's no point in my trying to steal that title. Uh, but he was not president of the club. His son was president of the club in 1922. That's the only vague uh, in investigation I could find but a past president has been given this opportunity, and I want the club to know I appreciate it. And I'll appreciate it even more if you pass by my wife slowly uh, out of the table where the books are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm breaking a rule, so I might as well just break it in half. <laughs> my wife of 60 plus years and our six children as they reach adulthood have been urging me to write a book for a long time. They knew I always loved to read. Two of our children are in Rotary. One 
Lisa was one of the first females in this club. She moved to Orlando, became president of the Orlando Club, and then she and her husband became number two in sales in that Aflac insurance duck in the United States. So she's done well as a Rotarian. Our son Jason is in the Lancaster Club, and he wanted to be here today, but he is in development. And he had a golf match with somebody who would be a very large development for the group that he works for, so he could not come, and I blessed him for it. <laughs> As my community life grew, our children asked more questions. So I took my questions to George Sheets, who is here, and I said, George, my family's been after me to write a book for a long time, and I can't imagine myself bearing the title author. It just doesn't seem to ring a bell. He said, well, sit down and let's talk. By the time he was finished, the bell rang, and I said, OK, I'm in your hands. And he smoothed the way. Now, one thing he said you'll need is a publisher. And I said, I think I know one, Jean Ream. She and her husband, Jim, have Ream Printing about four miles up 83, and they publish books. So I turned my material over to Jean Ream as I moved along. Uh, she also was the daughter of my second running mate for county commissioner, the late Bob Minnick. Both of my former commissioner friends are deceased, Bob Minnick and Luke Brown. Then, if you're lucky to get them to publish your book, then you'll also be fortunate to encounter a lady named Carrie Stump. Carrie is formidable in the art of finding periods and putting them where they should be, turning bad paragraphs into good paragraphs, and that type of activity. Would you just stand for a second, Karen? Thank you. And also, George Sheets is responsible for the publication that's been around today out on the table and out on the bulletin board. Showcase Now is a monthly, and so I'll be in Showcase Now for a month. Good for you, George. Good taste. <laughs> My life became a circle of opportunity working in radio on WRK. If you younger people can imagine, there were only two radio stations in this community when I joined WRK. WRK and WSBA. It's almost like the stagecoaches are running again. A third one came along, WNW. And there was an FM station owned by the Gazette and Daily. And they kept it open for about a year and a half and discovered there were no FM radios in New York at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a little bit of nonsense. The Gazette and Daily at the time was regarded as a very, very left-wing newspaper. And a lot of people weren't upset that their radio station failed. <laughs> and I was one, because it's just another competitor as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there was no TV, no local TV. <coughs> so now that you get the picture of me and my comment concerning uh, riding in a wagon. I stumbled into radio when a fine gent named Otis Morse IV heard me on a teenage radio show that I probably shouldn't have been on anyway. Uh, the Alcazar Ballroom on George Street, opposite what used to be our post office, was an organization called the TAC, Teenage Club. Um, it was formed to keep the children off the streets as their fathers were in the army and their mothers were in defense plants. And uh, we had clubs to belong to. You could be in a ping pong club. If you played a horn, you could play in the band. A couple of my friends joined the radio club. I had nothing to do on Sunday afternoon. So I went with them, and we did programs directed by Helen Miller Gopal. 
just for my own satisfaction. Does anybody remember Helen O'Donnell? She was a great teacher, was she not? And uh, she took Sunday afternoons to help us uh, do this radio program. After one of our programs one day, Otis Morse came into the studio and went like that, you with the blonde hair. Yeah, that was me at the time. Um, I'd like to see you in my office. So I went in and uh, we had a little conversation. And he said, uh, I'm going to have a part-time announcing position open pretty soon. I'd like to offer it to you. Well, he could have said to me, I'd like to teach you how to train elephants to gargle or something. <laughs> I mean, radio was nothing to me at the time. It was uh, what my father and mother listened to every night at 6 o'clock on WORK, the Gregory Gift Program of the Air, and my father always knew there was something wrong. He didn't win a suit in $10. <laughs> that was radio to me at the time. I had no no idea at all. My voice was satisfactory to radio, but this was Otis Morse. And he was really Mr. Radio in, time, in town at the time. Besides, I had been, since I was 14 years old, working in a dental lab downtown, uh, polishing repaired dental cases, and learning how to handle uh, torches to make things out of gold. And I was uh, 17, 18 years old, and I got tired of going home with bloody fingers from a polishing machine to, to make your dentures smooth. Some of you may be running your tongues around your mouth right now. <laughs> I, I may have had something to do with that. <laughs> At any rate, Morse said, well, keep it in mind, and uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. I said, fine. A week later, he called me, and he said, there's a new station opening in town on Duke Street, opposite the Yorktown Hotel, where the old city hall used to be. It's WNOW, and why don't you get on there and audition? I really think you'd do well in radio. So I did. And guess what? A man was just as smart as Odie Morse. He offered to be a part-time job in radio. I couldn't get full-time offers. About two weeks later, Odie Morse called me again and said there's a full-time job at WORK go down and ask for Harold Miller. I did. We auditioned, I auditioned for him for about uh, 45 minutes, reading a lot of news and baseball scores and so on. He said, I'd like you to work here full time for $38.50. Well, I was a full time announcer and rich. How could I turn something like that down? I, I, I didn't, of course. It was my first full-time job in radio. My first commercials I remember well. The first one was from the York Shirt Shops, who I understand have gone out of business. I hope I had no bearing on that. <laughs> my other commercial was Mount Grove Cemetery, and I understand they're still accepting customers. <laughs> my early assignments from Harold Miller, who was the manager, were any stars, anyone of any importance who came to York that would make interesting listening on WORK. The York Fair would be uh, one of the first, of course, um, big stars every year. But in those, these recent years, they had bands and groups. In those days, they had one or two big star inter in, uh, interviewers. <coughs> Um, I don't know if, it, does anybody remember Eddie Cantor? <laughs> a few weak hands there. Well, Eddie Cantor, I think, would be, without going too far, an Elvis Presley of his day. He was a major star. I thought, how would I get to interview Eddie Cantor? Well, I called the Yorktown Hotel. They put me through to his room. We spoke. He said he'd meet me at the fairgrounds. Seemed simple, this life that I was getting into. And he did meet me at the York Fairgrounds with every major media person in York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg. All older men, no ladies at the time, all older men waiting to jump in and have a talk with Eddie Kander. 
He said, I'm here to see Mr. Trout. Is Mr. Trout here? And I shrank against the wall and thought, holy cow, Harry McLaughlin and all those guys, and he's asking for me. And he said, uh, then I'll have to talk to you. I can't see you other folks. I'm on the stage in 30 minutes, and I'll just have to talk to this one gentleman. And uh, we walked into a little dressing room. Many of you have, most of you have never been in the dressing rooms under the York Fairgrounds. But believe me, there are little rooms. They each have one light bulb in the ceiling. And when that light bulb goes off, you are in pitch black darkness. As I sat my material down on the seat to sit beside the great Eddie Cantor, the stage went black. All the fuses blew. And I had a plug-in tape recorder. <laughs> so Eddie Cantor and I, now imagine yourselves with Elvis Presley. Elvis, uh, Eddie Cantor and I sat in the dark for 25 of the longest minutes of my life <laughs> because I didn't have a portable tape recorder. They hardly existed at the time. Well, that's how it started. Uh, Eddie and I, when the lights came back on, uh, he said he would be glad to talk to me for 30 minutes. And that's how my life of interviewing stars in York, Pennsylvania began. Um, I also have done the Spring Garden Band. I think I've emceed that band for 70 performances. And because I love the band. Uh, I, eventually, I got into 50 years of talent hunting for York Sports Night. And there I was able to sign people like Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mandel, Ted Williams, Ernie Banks, Hank Aaron, Harmon Kilbrew, Robin Roberts, and others. And I'm sure some of those names mean something to you. But I thought it would be nice if my children met them as well. So after the shows every year, I invited them to the house and they all accepted. And my wife made dinner for them, spaghetti usually. And my children were younger and didn't really get the impact of what some, who these, some of these people were. They knew they were important, they knew they were big, but the impact wasn't there until about 10 years later when they started bugging me about a book. And you know all those people. I said, well, I really don't know them, but they were here for dinner. And uh, I admit that. Uh, Bowie Coon was my guest when I was president of the Chamber of Commerce. We don't have a Chamber of Commerce anymore, do we? It seems everything I'm talking about is in the past. I better start moving toward the future. Uh, I was president of the Chamber of Commerce, and it was the president, the incoming president, who had the honor of selecting the speaker for his year or her year. I think it was his year most of the time. So I said, I'll get Bowie Coon if I can. No, no, no. We want someone like a vice president of U.S. Steel and so on. I said, it's no wonder you have trouble selling tickets. <laughs> you don't even know the man's name, and you're going to invite him here to speak to 600 people at the chamber dinner, and uh, I'm going to get Bowie Coon. So I wrote him a letter and told him he would be throwing out the first pitch the day after my dinner at the Yorktown Hotel, he'd be in Baltimore. Why didn't he plan to come to York, Pennsylvania and talk to 600 people about the baseball strike that was on at the time? And by golly, I got a letter about three months later, he was coming. And a couple of people at the Chamber of Commerce were a little upset by that because I had changed the focus of the Chamber of Commerce from U.S. Steel to baseball, which I considered a major industry as well. Meantime, I had become the station's sports director. I was doing 30 to 35 basketball games a year, um, 10 to 15 football games. My favorite and most important sports interviews were with Jesse Owens. I won't ask you because I don't know that there will be a hand raised um, to the question, do you know who Jesse Owens is? I know there's one, uh, and two, and three. All right, Jesse Owens is the guy who embarrassed Adolf Hitler in the 1936 Olympics by beating all Hitler's uh, track stars. 
uh, Hitler left the arena because of Jackie Owens, Jesse Owens. And by golly, we got him for our first York Area Sports Night, sponsored by Sam Shepard. We could hardly believe it ourselves. But as the years went by, I interviewed people like Jackie Robinson, who broke the color line in baseball, Muhammad Ali. How did I get in to see people like that? I got to know the guys on the door. It didn't matter if I knew the president or the general manager. They were up there someplace where I'd never find them. I, whenever I went to the Hershey Arena, I made a habit of going to several doors, shaking hands with doorkeepers, letting them know my face. I'm the guy who does basketball for York. And when I went to those arenas and there was a major star there, I didn't care if the major star knew I was there or not. If the guy let me in the door, I'd get to the star. And uh, I knew a lot of doorkeepers uh, in all over York County at that time. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, a man named John Kenley walked into the radio station and he said, I've rented the York Theater. Well, here's a question I'm going to ask. Anybody know where the York Theater was? One. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> well, the York Theater was at the bottom of the hill on East Market Street at the railroad track. There was a large theater, there was a skating rink with two or three, five, and tens, and John Kenley had rented the faculty of the, the whole facility to put on Broadway shows. And he asked me if I'd like to participate, and I said I would, and I could promote it on the radio station. Exactly why I'm talking to you, he said. So he said, now I'd like to make you an, uh, a member of Actors' Equity, and in my book, you'll see me, my union card, and I know there are a few people in here today who'd be shocked to know that I've been a union member of Actors' Equity for a long, long time. <laughs> The former members of the Chamber of Commerce would be surprised, I know. At any rate, in addition to painting and building sets here and in Lakewood, Pennsylvania, the other theater uh, due north of York, I had an opportunity to work in shows starring Veronica Lake and Jackie Cooper, Angela Lansbury, who had a show for a long time, Murder, She Wrote on TV, and I did replace, uh, for one show, Alan Ola from MASH in a show called Gramercy Ghost. So it was an exciting time for me. It's in the book. It's all in the book. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sports season, the Orioles decided that the station was strong enough and active enough to deserve someone on hand, and they paid my way to spring training. And I went there for a number of seasons. I also had uh, uh, several trips out of town with the team. Got to know them very well. I had one of the funniest baseball interviews of my career with a future Hall of Famer named Thurman Munson. He's been deceased now for some time. You won't believe what Thurman Munson and I did and how we did it, but it's in the book. <laughs> You'll have to believe it then. I wouldn't put anything in print that isn't true. With everything else that was going on, I was still active in Rotary and was selected by our Rotary District to escort five young men aged 25 to 35 on a six-week trip to a nation called Bangladesh. I went to the library, looked at their maps, and I couldn't find Bangladesh on the maps. My wife had not heard of it. I had to do some digging to find out where Bangladesh was. I found out. I found five young men who were willing to give up six weeks of their time to go to Bangladesh and help me in the most impoverished nation I could ever imagine. I saw poverty that I did not imagine before. We got up every day and went to various locations throughout the country and we would be met by long lines of mothers and or fathers waiting for us to give them shots of polio serum. We were trying to eliminate polio in the country. 
When we ran out, there would be a general moan and groan from the people. We, we would promise to come back as soon as we could. The poverty was so bad, the country is the size of Wisconsin. And when I left, the population was 185 million people, few babies under, over the age of four. Uh, reach that age, under the age of four, reach that age. Then I returned to my position at Memorial Hospital. Did I tell you I left radio and went to Memorial Hospital? Well, uh, I was on the uh, board of directors of Memorial Hospital, and they decided for the first time to hire a personnel director since they had reached 800 employees, and I was at the table that night, and I nudged my old friend from radio, Otis Morse, and I said, Odie, that's a job for me. He said, you're leaving radio? What's wrong? I said, it's just not what it used to be. I'd like to have that position. You may call that political activity. You may call it taking advantage of a situation, but that's the position I got um, at Memorial Hospital. I went back to it when I came back from Bangladesh. And then I thought I owed my wife some time, so we traveled to Greek islands, Turkey, the Holy Land. We walked the Great Wall of China. If anyone else has been there, you know that you can't really walk it very well because if there's a hill, you slide the whole way down. The millions of footprints that have been made on those bricks prevent you from walking very carefully, and she will confirm with me the number of ladies cried all the way down on their fannies. <laughs> they simply couldn't walk. We still believe with all of our traveling in the world that Pennsylvania and Alaska are the two most beautiful states in, in the country. After all of my life of traveling and interviewing and meeting people, I carried a tape recorder, I carried a camera, there's lots of, there's 159 pictures in my book. And I also carried black and blue, uh, black uh, uh, pens, thick pens. And I thought to myself, these are important people, maybe I should get a few signatures. And I started, and I got six each time because I said, yeah, we have six children, I'd like you to six, sign six of those. Jackie Robinson smiled and said, you really have six children? I said, yes. He said, okay, give me the balls. And uh, he signed all six balls, and everybody else that I met did the same thing. And when I decided to stay home with my wife and help her in the garden or whatever else she needed me to do, I discovered that I, we had collected, I had collected 30,000 signed items for my children. 18-inch bats from the Hall of Fame, balls, 8 by 10 pictures, 3 by 5 cards, special programs. Now, like the stock market, the prices keep going up. Balls being signed today by youngsters who are in the game for one season are being sold for $250, $500. A Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner ball, a Ty Cobb ball, uh, three to five thousand dollars each a signature. So I think I've given my children a, a little endorsement there and I had a lot of fun. The whole story is available today when you leave the meeting at a price out on the table. We'll be announcing times and days when I'll be signing books at other locations. The Spring Garden Band concert in Red Lion on April the 6th. Urban's Books, 2159 White Street, across from the Manchester Mall, April 19th at 2 o'clock. And we are arranging to be at Brown's Market in Loganville, York Martin Library, Collinsville Library, Silmetal Church in North York, Muddy Creek Forks, and any other location I can talk into putting my books on the table. <laughs> I really appreciate this opportunity today. I haven't, uh, except to lead a song now and again, I haven't done a whole lot of talking from this microphone, and it's so nice to see so many of you here, and especially those who came uh, to honor me today. I, I really appreciated that.
Thank you very much. I'll turn this back to the only fellow who's not a past president today. But two days from today, maybe, if we keep it going the way it's going. Al Sykes, thank you. Thank you very much.